Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to another edition of the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast, part of the 90 Min Football Network. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simiou, and this is a mailbag edition of the show, a show built around the questions that you guys have been sending in over the last 24 hours or so. And I don't want to set the bar or the expectation too high, but in terms of the quality of the questions, this is right up there with the mailbag episodes that we've done, I would say. Just sort of looking through them, picking some of them out. I think there's some really, really interesting and fantastic questions in here. So I can't wait uh, to get into this one. But if I could just quickly ask you before we dive into the content uh, to make sure that if you're watching us on YouTube, you leave a like on the video, you subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. If you're listening on audio, then please, of course, uh, do leave us a review as well. That very, very much helps. Uh, This podcast is brought to you by our good friends over at NordVPN and we'll tell you a little bit more about what you can get from NordVPN uh, in uh, partnership with this podcast later on in the show. So stay tuned uh, for that as well. But without further ado, let's dive straight into it. So we've got questions from the YouTube channel, from the members Discord server, and we've got questions from Twitter as well. So what I've done is picked a few from each of those uh, so that we can try and um, cover as many different topics uh, as we can over the next 20, 25 minutes or so, maybe even longer, depending on how uh, how carried away I get with my answers. We'll see. Um, let's take this one first from YouTube. And this one comes from Simranjit Singh, who says, do you think the All or Nothing documentary has helped us in regards to attracting top players? I feel before a lot of people slash players had Arteta down as quite difficult to work under, but the documentary showed him in a totally different light. Will we be showcasing more behind the scenes footage in the future? So do I think the All or Nothing documentary helped? Um, Yeah, I do, um, would be my kind of overarching answer to that. And I think it's helped different parts in different ways, if that makes sense. So for example, I think it has helped to show Mikel Arteta in a different light, as you say. I think players look at him as someone who may come up with the odd wacky idea, speakers on the training ground, etc., etc. But overall, I think it shows him as somebody who really cares and who's incredibly passionate about his job. Um, somebody that the players have bought into, somebody that really gets and understands the values of, of one of English football's greatest clubs. And, and I think when you take all of that into consideration uh, and you think about maybe what the preconception was around Mikel Arteta, where... You know, we'd seen him come in and, and sort of move players on and we'd seen it, um, him, you know, leave players out of the team that maybe we as fans thought should be playing. I think there was this thing of, well, maybe he's a bit stubborn. Maybe he thinks he's a bit above where he actually is in terms of his career. Maybe he's a little bit arrogant. And the truth is that you do need some of that to su- survive and to succeed at this level of football. But at the same time, um, I think you can be misread from the outside looking in. I remember one of the big misconceptions was people used to say, well, he doesn't fancy or rate Gabriel Martinelli. And so if I were Gabriel Martinelli, I'd be leaving the club uh, at the earliest opportunity. I remember people saying that. I remember the whole Kieran Tierney thing, you know, um, at the start of this season, why isn't Kieran Tierney playing? Mikel Arteta's mistreating him, etc., etc. But it's because um, he brought in Alexander Zinchenko, someone that has just added a totally different dimension to the team. So I think based on some of Mikel's decisions, based on the fact that there were a lot of fans that were kind of on on the Ozil side of the Ozil Arteta thing and that were maybe on the Abamyang side of the Arteta Abamyang thing, yeah, maybe there was a preconception about what he's like to work with. But I think everybody that's there now is committed. Everybody that's there loves working under him. Um, I know it's easy for people to say nice things when the project is flourishing as it is now. But I think overall, I think you can really see that Mikel Arteta is is somebody that will attract players for us and will be a big part in our recruitment strategy because when the results come that that backs all of that up and obviously that gives him um, that kind of gravitas when going into those conversations but I think also what the documentary did was allow us to see that Mikel Arteta is not what maybe other people perceived Mikel Arteta to be and um, and so I do think it's helped in a lot of ways. And I think that people will have watched the documentary and then watched how Arsenal have kind of grown off the back of that and will feel like it's a club moving in the right direction. So I think there is a um, 
there is a greater pull. You know, there's always been a pull at Arsenal. It's a massive football club, but I think that's obviously increased based on the fact that the documentary I thought was really well put together. And then off the back of that, having laid those foundations that we saw in the documentary, Arsenal have pushed on and become a much better side and a much stronger side. And they're now challenging at the time of recording for a Premier League title. So yeah, Uh, will we be showcasing more behind the scenes footage in the future? I think Arsenal are always going to be careful about what they put out, as any big football club would be. Um, But I think things like bench cam, which we often see on the club's YouTube channel and on the socials, I think we're seeing a lot more sort of featured interviews with sort of individual players. I think when you think about all of that stuff, and and Arsenal have been clever in what they've allowed other media outlets to do as well. Remember the Granite Xhaka piece? Um, Some of my closest mates at, at the Players' Tribune Uh, were behind that and put that together and that was fantastic and you know that was an opportunity for Granit Xhaka to set the record straight and I think people responded to that generally really well and he's been able to push on as a result of that so I think what Arsenal have got much better at is managing their relationships with media outlets but also putting out the media that they believe um, is going to be positive and is going to help them in terms of building that connection with the fans so I think we will get more um, of that type of stuff over time Uh, but yeah, um, there's no doubt in my mind that the All or Nothing documentary and some of the other things that the club have done from a PR perspective have helped and, and have made Arsenal a much more attractive proposition by one of the ways they've done it is by showing the manager, I think, in a really good light as well. Let's take this one from Matt G. Um, this one is a little bit left field. Um, I didn't expect a question of this nature, but um, credit to Matt, uh, long time member. Love Matt. Thank you so much for this one, mate. He says, if Newcastle don't make the top four, do you think we should test them with a cheeky bid for Bruno Gimaraish? Mate, I, <laughs> I'd love to think that that was a possibility, but I just don't. Um, Newcastle aren't short of a few quid, are they? So it's going to be difficult to kind of strong arm them into selling one of their best players, probably their best player, at a time where that project is is on the up as well. Um, I like Bruno Gimaraish. We talked about him at length when he was linked with Arsenal, that he'd be a good fit. Um, the, the money that Leon were demanding seemingly from Arsenal felt a little bit over the top and they softened when Newcastle came along. Um, he joined Newcastle lots was made about that decision to go there he didn't reject Arsenal for Newcastle let's get that straight Um, Arsenal didn't go as far as Newcastle did in terms of the negotiations and in terms of the progress uh, to make that deal happen but you know I would like to think that Arsenal have a bigger pull than Newcastle in fact they do have a bigger pull than Newcastle at the moment Um, but with Newcastle not being short of a few quid and with Bruno Gimaraes Uh, starting to etch his name into uh, Magpie's folklore, I don't see that move happening um, anytime soon. Uh, You know, if it got to the point where Bruno Gimaraes continued in his progress as an individual and Newcastle was stagnating and weren't able to make that next step, then maybe, you know, but at this moment, I don't think Bruno Gimaraes leaving the club is even a possibility as much as I'd like him at Arsenal. Uh, let's take this one from Matt Gunnar, who says, uh, presuming we do win the league, would you prefer to do it on the last day against Wolves or have it wrapped up before and have the Wolves game as a massive party? Matt, I'm not talking about title celebrations. Uh, every question of this nature that I've had over the last month, I've batted it away and I'm going to do the same. I'm really sorry, mate, but there is such a long way to go. There is so much more football to be played. There are so many difficult games upcoming for the Arsenal. I cannot get carried away and and start thinking about how or when we're going to win it you know we've got to win it um first and foremost let's let's go and do that and whatever way it comes we'll take it and we'll be over the moon if we manage to get over the line but at this moment in time I'm not even thinking about that I'm not thinking beyond Anfield on Sunday at this moment in time I don't think we can afford to uh thanks for the question though uh nice uh, nice one thanks for jumping on Uh, John Daly's got a few questions. Um, I'm going to pick... I'm going to pick a couple uh, from John's because he's put three in. Um, He says, could Arsenal sell unused seats on a match day, maybe at half time, giving normal match going fans a chance to get in? That's an interesting suggestion. I'd never thought of that. Um, Would there be people willing to buy tickets at half time? Obviously, they'd be half the price because you'd only be watching half of a match, I guess. And, you know, you could um, sort of make them available 
in the lead up to half time when you know that um you know when you know that those seats haven't been occupied and you give people essentially the 15 minutes of the half time break to get in and find their seats maybe i mean it's the idea of people hanging outside the stadium um hanging around outside the stadium to maybe find the ticket that i think the club would be against i don't think they would like that i don't think that would be an ideal situation based on so many factors, security, uh, the managing of the crowd outside, etc., etc. Plus, if I were a fan and I wasn't going to the game and I didn't have a ticket at the start of the game, I'd want to be somewhere to sit and watch it and somewhere to take it in. Is outside the stadium the place to do that? I, I don't really think it is. It's an interesting suggestion, but I don't think it's one you'll see the club move forward with just because of those factors that I've mentioned. You don't want crowds of people hanging around outside. You don't want a massive scramble for the tickets um, if they do become available. And what do those people do for the first 45 minutes of a game while they're waiting for the potential of some seats to be available? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, The other one um, that John um, put in, which I want to just quickly touch on, is about Rob Holding. He says, if Rob Holding keeps up this uh, between now and the end of the season, meaning his current form, do you think he would get an England call up? <laughs> um, I think it's it's way too soon to be talking about Rob Holding as an England international. I think he's had a couple of good games against sides that we should be beating at home, sides that you know are in the relegation scrap. Ultimately, I don't think I'm going to read too much into that. I've seen Rob Holding come in for the odd game here and there over the years and do okay. That's what Rob Holding has been able to do. Uh, for Arsenal Football Club ever since the day he joined. But the problem comes when you have to persist with Rob Holding over a longer period of time. And often we've seen him uh, fall short and often we've seen his level, unfortunately, exposed. So listen, I wish him all the best. I'm behind him. I'm supporting him. Obviously, while he has to fill the shoes of William Saliba, he's all we've got in the right centre-back position. Tommy Asu's not going to be back anytime soon, uh, which is obviously a blow. And so, yeah, um, Rob Holding is what we have and we have to get behind him and we have to support him. But I'm not even convinced that he's going to be good enough for this run in of games, let alone uh, talking about an England call up. Now, I take the point that there are some centre halves in that England squad that aren't much better than Rob Holding. I get that. But I just think at this stage in his career, it's unlikely that Gareth Southgate's going to go, oh, I've been sleeping on that. Rob Holding should be in this squad and that he's going to bring him in. So I don't think Rob Holding gets anywhere near the England squad. And um, and I just want him to perform in the next few games. And um, and that's all my focus is on. And, and I think that's what his focus should be on as well. You don't need players distracted at this point in the season. And I don't think Rob Holding will feel that he's in line for an England call-up. I think, as as I said, at this stage in his career, he'll probably feel that that's passed him by. And he'll probably be content with that, you know. So, um, Rob Holding for England, not for me. Not for me. Uh, right, let's move on to some questions from the Discord server. Uh, Richie put in a really, really good question, uh, which was, what's your combined 11 from the current team and the Invincibles? I'm not going to answer this one, Richie. No offence, please don't take offence. But the reason I'm not going to answer this one is because I'm going to hold fire on it because I wanted to do a special bit of content on this. Um, I wanted to do a whole show where we break it down, where we look at the Invincible starting eleven and we compare it to this one and we try and come up with some kind of um, combined eleven from those two sides. But the reason I haven't done that yet is because I'm quite keen to keep my powder dry at this point. You know, this team haven't achieved anything yet. You know, this team haven't won the Premier League title, which until they do, I don't think they can even be talked about in the same conversation as the Invincibles. Yes, they've brought us all back into um, love with our football club and they've really given us something special. I've thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed watching these guys um, and, and the connection I feel to them and, and to the team and to the manager and everything is, is special. But until they go on and win a Premier League title, I don't think we can justify making this piece of content, um, you know, combining the two 11s. But if we do go on and win the league, or maybe at the end of the season, regardless, if we continue to do well and, and continue to impress and, and maybe narrowly miss out, then maybe we can have this conversation Uh, But at this moment, I want to keep my powder dry on that one. But it's a great question. And it is something that I've got noted down on my desk at home uh, as a future piece of content. 
We'll continue answering the questions in just a moment after a very, very short message. Just going to quickly uh, bring you up to speed uh, with our partners over at NordVPN. I told you that I'll be letting you know a little bit later on in the show uh, what it is uh, that you can get with regards to NordVPN. Our partners uh, supporting the podcast at the moment, named, of course, one of Time's 2022 Best Inventions. What is NordVPN? It's a virtual private network that you can sign up to. It's the price of a cup of coffee per month. And the benefits, I'm sure you'll agree, more than justify the cost now you can protect your data whilst traveling and using public wi-fi nordvpn protects you wherever you are in the world watching sporting events tv shows and films that aren't available in your region you can purchase flights subscriptions and more at cheaper prices by logging in from another location and you can grab your exclusive nordvpn deal by going to nordvpn.com forward slash chronicles afc you'll get a huge discount off of your plan plus four additional months for free. It's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee, so you'll want to check that out. Um, just to give you a bit of context as to you know how those benefits can work for you, um, I mean, watching sporting events, so many things that we want to watch here in the UK are geo-blocked, but if you log in uh, via a virtual private network and set your location as elsewhere, You'll be able to get around all of those blocks. I use it quite a bit when I want to watch Greek football, for example. I know that won't appeal to everyone, but, um, you know, the, the TV channels over there, if you try and access them from here, they're geo-blocked. But if you um, are on NordVPN and you sign in as being in Greece, for example, or in Cyprus, you'll be able to log onto those websites with no problems. Equally, you can log on to Netflix via a United States location and you'll be able to um, watch their inventory of stuff which is different if you want to book flights you know sometimes it's cheaper to book it from the place that you're coming from but your computer knows that you're in the UK and so you get a different price so why not change your lo location and see if you can get it cheaper a lot of the time you'll find that you can it also as I say protects your data which is really really important in this modern age where we have everything saved on our computers um, so uh, yeah make sure you check it out it is well worth uh, the price of a cup of coffee per month the benefits are incredible and as i say huge discount available plus four additional months for free uh, if you use the code nordvpn.com slash chronicles afc all the details are in the description i know a lot of you use it already this is your opportunity uh, to uh, to re-sign up and get it that little bit cheaper and get it with those additional four months cheers uh, Mike underscore 63 from the Discord server says, if you could sign one player from the Premier League right now, who would it be? Well, generally speaking, I'd like to see us go out and get Declan Rice in the summer. Um, I don't think Declan Rice is, is the answer or is the perfect answer to the Thomas Partey problem at six. But I think he is someone that could play the eight role. And I think he's someone that could play the six role if we needed him to in the absence of Partey, for example, to a much higher standard than anybody else we have available. Um, so generally speaking, that's what I'd look at. I'd look at somebody like Declan Rice. I still feel like in all the business that we've done over the last few years, the centre of midfield is still the bit where we're on the thinnest ice in terms of the drop-off between Partey and everybody else is so big. Um, Jorginho coming on a low price deal to help us with depth and help us in that sense. But, you know, he's not He's not the same level. He doesn't do the same jobs. He certainly isn't as mobile as Thomas Partey or a Declan Rice, who would certainly be an upgrade in that position. But if you're asking me right now, in terms of like today, I'd probably go out and sign a centre-back because we're worryingly short there uh, right now. Tommy Asu out for the season, which means Ben White coming inside is not an option. We don't have another right-back at the club to facilitate that. Plus, you'd be moving two positions around uh, to try and uh, and deal with that. We've got Jakub Kivior in at centre-back, but he's a very much a left-sided centre-back. And the fact that Mikel has not wanted to throw him in at such a crucial stage on his wrong side, I think is probably fair. Um, but so my answer of Declan Rice for the longer term um, is valid. But I think if we're talking about today, I'd probably look at a centre-back uh, because we need one alongside Gabriel, who's been phenomenal this season. And um, and so maybe Ruben Diaz, I don't know. If, if you're asking me who would I like if I had a blank check and 
and the ability to lure anybody in. Um, I quite like the look of Lissandro Martinez as well, generally speaking, um, since he joined Man United. I, I think we were right not to pay what Man United paid for him, um, but I, I think he's impressed. But again, you're talking about a left-sided centre-back. We need a right-sided one, really, or at least one who is right-footed that can play there. Maybe a John Stones, he'd probably fit into our game quite well. Um, but yes, yeah, centre-back would be would be the option um, for me, or, or would be the first thing that I look at. And, and I've addressed a couple of names uh, there for you guys. Um, let's take uh, a couple from Trev, uh, Creambone66 in the Discord server. He's dropped a few questions in there. Uh, we'll pick a couple of them. Um, he says, at what point in the season did you start to believe we could actually win the title and what made you believe it? I guess for me, the turning point in terms of my mentality was the Bournemouth game and the way we kind of came from 2-0 down to turn that game on its head and to win it in such dramatic fashion. You have those moments in title races where you feel like this could be your year and that was very much one of them. Um, you have moments where you need the rub of the green and I thought, you know, you could argue we had that. Obviously, it was down to our persistence and our effort and our work rate and the fact that we were creating opportunities, etc., that we managed to turn the game around. But I think for me, um, yeah, I'd, I'd kind of kept my guard up until that point. I didn't want to get sucked into the title race talk. I didn't want to allow myself to believe and then end up being disappointed. And I still thought it was really early. I still think it's early to say that we've won it. I still think it's early to say that we're in control. Um, or that we're totally in control and that this is ours to literally, you know, cruise to now. Um, but Bournemouth was the point for me where I went, hold on a minute, you know, th this could be a thing. You know, this does feel a little bit like the stars are aligning for us. So, um, yeah, the Bournemouth game would be the point at which I started to believe. And um, and why? Because it made me feel like the stars, as I say, were aligning and, and Arsenal, um, you know, could potentially go on and... Um, and uh, and do what was, as I keep saying, unthinkable at the start of the season. Another good question from Trev is uh, three players that have surprised you this season by exceeding expectations. I had to think about this one for a little while, but the three I'm going to go with are first up Ben White, because not because I didn't think he was a good player. I, I knew that he was a fantastic player. I know um, what Ben White is all about, but because um, I didn't see him being so comfortable at right back. I mean, if you look back to last season, we were all talking about Tommy Asu uh, being the right back. You know, we were talking about how that was the way we were going to move forward. And then what happened was Tommy Asu was injured and Ben White was putting it right back and then has done an excellent job and it's just gotten better and better and better in that position. And so I think, not that I was surprised by Ben White's quality, but I've been surprised by how well he's adapted and how well he's been able to help us going forward, um, attack teams and all of that stuff, which I, I didn't really have him down as that type of player. So, yeah, I'm going to go with um, with Ben White on that one uh, at right back. The other two, I'm going to go with Xhaka. Um, again, a player that I've always defended. You guys will know that, that have been watching this for a long, long time. Uh, but I think the levels that he's hit and the way he's been able to to keep them up consistently throughout the duration of this season, I think has surprised everybody, including some of his supporters like myself. I never thought Granit Xhaka was ever as bad as people made him out to be. I think the change of position uh, for Granit Xhaka has, has really helped him. Uh, we know from listening to Granit Xhaka and from Mikel Arteta that actually Granit Xhaka, when he was told he was going to change position and play this different role, wasn't completely comfortable with it. You know, he even now find some of the things that he's being asked to do maybe a little bit unnatural but look at the way he's got forward and scored goals and influenced attacks and and the fact that he's no longer the last line of midfield defense means that he doesn't have his shortcomings if you want to call them that exposed anywhere near as regularly as he would have done in the past i think the system is much more compact the shape is better and and all of that has contributed to granite Xhaka's sort of you know, positive arch of success. But at the same time, you have to give him immense credit for being able to maintain this level throughout the season. He's one of Arsenal's most important players now. And 18 months ago, 24 months ago, people were calling for him to be replaced. People out there probably still do feel that there are eights out there that would maybe suit us a little bit more. 
and that you know we could do with bringing in some competition for Granit Xhaka but nobody's exactly um, you know clamoring for him to be moved out of the club tomorrow now are they and that is a testament to how well he's done when you think about the relationship he had with the fans uh, not so long ago and, and the relationship that he has with them now they're chanting his name at every single game um, yeah he's he's definitely in that list and the other one I'm going to put is Zinchenko now I knew that Zinchenko was a top quality player I must admit when he came in I thought it was with a view to him being a midfielder but also helping us out at left back when we needed it I thought that one of the reasons that made him such a big appeal to Mikel Arteta would have been his probably inability or, or lack of faith in Kieran Tierney's fitness. Um, but Zinchenko has come in, he's taken the left back spot, he's made it his own, he's added a totally different dimension to this team and he continuously performs at a really high level and has had an incredible influence on the dressing room, on the group. And um, yeah, I'm just, I've, I've been taken aback by what an impact he's had. I didn't think a left back in a football team could be as influential as Alexander Zinchenko has been. Yes, he's an unorthodox left back. He plays in an inverted uh, position a lot of the time. He joins in with the midfield, but I just think overall his impact has been huge. So the three that have surprised me by exceeding expectations, Ben White at right back, Xhaka in midfield and Zinchenko at left back. Um, Let's move on to Peeny Wien's question, which is one with regards to that lot down the road. Um, he says, Antonio Conte's recent outburst was amazing, but is it possible that Daniel Levy and co may have been so humiliated they might actually sit down and hatch a plan to try and change the history of Tottenham? I don't want to spend too long talking about that lot, um, but Antonio Conte's outburst was incredibly entertaining. And I think a lot of people would have watched it and thought, wow, this is crazy. This is unprecedented. Like, I can't believe what I'm hearing. But when you actually go back and analyze what it is that Antonio Conte said, I think you'd be hard pressed to find people that would disagree with it, even among Tottenham supporters. I've spoken to loads. I live around loads of them. That's what happens when you live in North London. And a lot of them feel that maybe Antonio Conte crossed the line. But there's also a, a huge group of them that feel that it needed to be said. And Antonio Conte had the cojones to go out and do that. Um, will it change the way that Daniel Levy and co operate? I, I don't think it will. Um, you know, I just I just don't see it. I think that he is stubborn. Um, I think that he is um, set in his ways. I think that he's got targets that have nothing to do with football with regards to financials and, and with regards to the business side of the football club. And I think that you know, he's kept in a job because he meets those targets and he does what the ownership are, are looking for. You know, you constantly hear about Spurs, um, you know, embarking on partnerships with the NFL and with the uh, Formula One and, and go-kart tracks and this and that and skywalks on top of the stadium and all of that stuff. Commercially, they've doing, they're, they're doing and have done a really, really good job. But it's where that line is drawn between, you know, prioritising the commercial stuff and the football that I think is where people have a problem with Tottenham. And, you know, we had a bit of an issue with that. When we moved into our stadium, we had to balance the books in some way. What Tottenham have probably done better than us is found other avenues of generating revenue that um, has helped them along that journey. Whereas we were very much like, well, we just got to keep selling our best players in order to keep our heads above water. Tottenham have done it in other ways and, and credit to them for that but you know you have to question how high up Daniel Levy's priority list winning a trophy um, actually is the fans are desperate for it but you know it doesn't seem to be that um, that urgent for Tottenham Hotspur as long as they're balancing the books and as long as they're meeting their financial objectives so will it change what Daniel Levy does or how he approaches it I'd be shocked if it does because we've seen so many years of this that um, you know, I think even if you were the most positive Spurs fan in the world, you'd, you'd struggle to believe that things are going to change that dramatically under Daniel Levy's chairmanship, even after Antonio Conte's rant. I'm going to take this one from Graham. Uh, it came through on Twitter. He said, given the managerial merry-go-round at the moment, what deal would you be offering Mikel Arteta at the end of the season to make sure he stays? Now, Mikel Arteta signed until June 2025 last April um, so we're only about a year into that extension um, 
you know, he's still going to have two years left after this year. And I think as a manager, I, I probably wouldn't want to commit beyond that. You know, things can change quite quickly. You know, if Mikel Arteta meets the objectives that he personally sets uh, with regards to Arsenal Football Club in a short period of time, then maybe he will feel that he wants to move on and, and try his luck and try his hand elsewhere. And if Mikel Arteta does go on and win the Premier League, in fact, regardless of whether he does or not, people will be looking at him and thinking this guy came into a big football club that was in a mess and he completely turned it on its head. That makes him a huge appeal because there are loads of big football clubs in the world at the moment that are in a bit of a mess and in a bit of a state that would kill to have a manager who has got the thick skin to be able to come in and go through that difficult period but knowing that he has a clear plan, he has a blueprint of how to do it and that eventually he's going to bring the team out of the other side as he's done at Arsenal. Um, but yeah, if I were Mikel Arteta having just signed that deal until 2025, I probably wouldn't want to sign another deal now that keeps me at the club beyond that. I probably would want to just keep my options open uh, for a couple of years. It doesn't mean he doesn't love the club. It doesn't mean he's not happy here. But a lot can happen in football over the space of a couple of years. He's got a couple of years left on his deal. I think if you get into next season and things are still moving in the right direction, that's probably when you sit down and talk to Mikel Arteta about a new deal. Um, but yeah, we'll see. Um, that's his current situation. Signed until June 2025, last April. I think, I think Arsenal just need to support him and back him really in the transfer market um, in terms of what he wants. And if you do that, then I think that sends the right message. And then as a byproduct of that, any contract negotiations should be much more straightforward. But yeah, um, I don't think there's a massive urgency to deal with that this summer. And I don't think it will be dealt with this summer or, or even addressed. I think at the moment, the priority is tying down a few of these uh, key players. We haven't had officials on the uh, Bukayo Saka deal. You know, we're hoping to get one wrapped up with William Saliba as well. I think those things will take precedence. Um, going into this summer and the final question I'm going to take uh, from AFCWRX7 on Twitter hi Harry given the respective fixture lists for the running who out of City and Arsenal do you suspect has the easier running and what chance do you give each side of taking the title for me City have the easier running by about a country mile in terms of the Premier League fixtures now maybe you could offset that against the fact that Arsenal are only in the Premier League don't have any Champions League distractions, don't have any FA Cup distractions. But I think City have the squad to cope with that anyway. So um, my view is that City have the better running. Um, City, when you look at their fixtures, you could make a really strong case that they win every single game, including the one at home to Arsenal. Um, obviously, at the moment, it is in our hands. But we are, as I said to you guys yesterday, and I've said throughout this week, we're only one draw away from giving up the control in this title race. So I do make Manchester City slight favourites on that basis because of A, the fact that they've got the easier running and the, the lead that we have or the advantage that we have given that if we draw one game, swings back the other way. I think it is a really precarious lead that we have. And so I make City 55% favourites against 45% Arsenal. That's how I would work it out in terms of the probability of who's going to go on and win the title. But we know things can change from week to week. You know, it only takes one uh, week of, of having an off performance in this division for you to drop points and then hand the, the control in this title charge over to your op uh, to your opposition, to your opponent. So, yeah, I think Manchester City would be slight favourites for me at about 55% and Arsenal uh, would be at 45% if I was working out the probability. Um, right now but that's my opinion and uh, feel free to let me know yours in the chat in the comments etc okay um, those are the questions uh, those are my answers hope you enjoyed uh, the q and A. I just want to say a massive congratulations uh, while we're on the topic of um, of this week and, and, and while we're looking back at um, sort of recent events uh, I want to say big congratulations to the Arsenal under 18s managed of course by Jack Wilshire, who booked their place in the FA Youth Cup final last night. Uh, managed to catch some of this game on the Arsenal website. Um, I'm so glad that I chose to follow along with this one 
rather than persist with that nonsense between Chelsea and Liverpool, which was really dull and really, really boring. Uh, the Gunners uh, won the semi-final by two goals to one, uh, beating Manchester City, and they did it in dramatic fashion. Um, Miles Lewis Skelly, uh, with a brave header, uh, turned in Bradley Ibrahim's pass uh, to break City hearts. Uh, there was a wonderful free kick scored by Mikhail Rosiak as well. Um, City played most of the game with 10 men. Um, you have to you have to say that to, to kind of be fair in your analysis. But I thought Arsenal just really were relentless and, and really battled hard and and did a brilliant job of, of, you know, booking their place in the final. And people like Lewis Skelly, um, who is that little bit younger um, than the rest of the group, shining again at Charles Watts, I think gave him a nine out of 10 in terms of his player ratings. Lots being made of the bravery he showed in order to win that header for the goal. Um, but he just seemed to find this energy in midfield to make that run into that position that maybe nobody else had at that point in the game. Uh, Bradley Ibrahim, who um, I saw a couple of times earlier in the season when I worked on uh, the under-21s for the club, um, did really, really well as well in front of the back four. I thought he looked really good too. Um, Jack Wilshire has been speaking really positively about his role over the last few days. He's been talking a lot about how Mikel Arteta has inspired him. And after the way Jack Wilshire's career just kind of fell off, m more so through injury than anything else, because we know the talent was there, I'm really pleased to see him like having found something that keeps him going and, and something that keeps that fuel or that fire fueled in in terms of his in his belly you know that keeps him going that keeps him wanting to push forward and, and that motivates him and I think he's really found a home because Jack Wilshire better than anybody knows how quickly you can rise in in football he also knows the hard work it takes before that point where you really take off but he also knows that once you've got to that point and, and you feel like you're on top of the world it can all disappear very, very quickly. And I think he's got, although it's sad for him and sad the way his career ended up, it's the perfect experience, I think, to be able to pass on to young players that are making their way in the game. Um, and yeah, so congratulations to Jack Wilshire and of course the under 18s and we'll be fully behind them in the final, of course. And uh, fingers crossed they can go out and win that as well because, um, you know, getting to the FA Youth Cup final is a pretty big deal. Um, I know a lot of people would think, oh, maybe, well, you know, it's the Youth Cup final. It doesn't mean an awful lot. How many of those players uh, end up, um, you know, actually making an impact for the team later on? But I think, you know, it is a big thing. It is a, a big moment for those young players, especially some of them who are much younger, but are playing in the under 18s. Um, the other thing is as well, it just shows the club in such a positive light. You know, the women's team is really, really strong. The men's team is really, really strong at the moment. The youth team is producing now as well and is making an impact in the FA Youth Cup. And all of those things combined just um, to show Arsenal to be in a really, really good place right now. So it's great to see. Right, we're going to leave it there. Thank you so, so much uh, for tuning in to the Chronicles of Aguna, the mailbag edition. Really, really appreciate your support as always. And uh, we'll be back very, very soon with more. Until next time, take care. Goodbye.